Welcome back to the Not Quite Pod. Today we've got Tatum with us. Tatum, do you just want to quickly introduce yourself and let everyone know a bit about yourself? Well, hello, I'm Tatum. I'm a presenter, an audio producer. I do a lot of accessibility and inclusion consulting. I also do a lot of creative talent work. I basically love telling stories and making things. So lots of different stuff going on uh, work-wise. Um, in my life, I live in Camden with my cat, Burdock, who I'm obsessed right with. He'll probably get involved at some point, to be honest. I'm a witch, so there's a lot of magic and ritual in my life. And I'm neurodivergent, queer, gender fluid, and I have limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Cool. What a combo. Yeah, I know that there's so many things I need to talk about. Um, for those who don't know you, I always get my guests to do this. For those who don't know you, can you take us on sort of your journey so far to get you to the point you're at today? So like going from your childhood up until now and sort of what challenges you faced, what successes you've had and just sort of any pinnacle moments that you've had come up uh, during those times, just to sort of give anyone a bit of context as to your journey, really. Yeah, so I grew up in Leicester, Midlands, <laughs> and I had a really challenging upbringing, actually. Um, very unstable, uh, a lot of neglect. My dad wasn't around a lot, and my mum had a lot of her own challenges. Um, mm. And from that, there was a lot of distraction. So I had to look after myself from a very young age um, and mature a lot quicker than um, I should have had to really. And I was, I started training as a dancer when I was really young. I, I always really struggled with anything academic. I struggled in school. Um, I struggled to sort of like use my voice to communicate. So I found that dancing was this way for me to really release things and something that I was good at. And so I really dedicated a lot of my, uh, well, my life from the age of about three till 19 was mostly dancing. I mean, it was lots of different types of theatre as well. Um, but that was the thing that I yeah, concentrated on the most. But I also did a bit of singing, a bit of acting. And um, so I actually didn't know that I was born with muscular dystrophy. It didn't show until I was 18. Well, there mm. were some signs when I was 15, but we the doctors didn't know what it was you know classic and they thought oh we'll give you some anti-inflammation meds because my legs just blew up overnight mm -hmm. and this was one of the challenges about being a dancer because a lot of the time i would think oh this is an injury or something related to that so it kind of like pushed back me recognizing in some ways i was so in tune with my body so i knew there was something wrong but actually the outside world, you know, doctors or teachers would be like, oh, no, you're just using your body in a different way. Um, so, yeah, I uh, got lots of different scholarships and things to uh, do my training because we weren't very financially stable um, growing up. And then I finally got a scholarship into one of the best uh, stage schools in London. So I was 18 at the time, moved to London. I was like, I have no idea how I'm going to pay for everything else, you know, my, my rent and food, but I'm going to find a way to do it. Like <laughs> I've got this big opportunity. And so I was um, training for my degree. And when I first got there, my body was behaving how it always had because I was put into the top set because you have to do you get put into like three different classes and I was put into the top set for the dance stuff. And um, yeah, it was like, I think a few months into my training, my body started to act in strange ways. Like I couldn't rise on my tiptoes. I was struggling to jump. I was experiencing really like strange pain. And uh, it was a weird one because I was almost, I was so afraid of everything being taken from me because I'd finally got to this point yep. that I was sort of trying to hide it. But at the same time, I was like, I know there's something wrong. Yep. So I obviously went to the teachers and said, you know, there's something going on. And they sent me to, there was a physio who was in the school and there's also a doctor. Both of them were like, never seen anything like this before. 
Um, I wasn't getting any, any answers. And so I carried on with my training, but I really couldn't do a lot of the dance stuff. And I was like spiraling because, you know, thinking you're just so, so in limbo, like you have no idea what's going on. And uh, sadly, by the time I got to the end of my first year, my body was really breaking down, still didn't know what was going on, that they said to me, you know, you're obviously going to have to go away and figure out what this is but we can't hold on to your scholarship. So I'm like, well, I can't be here without a scholarship. So, but I was like, I'll just guess I'll have to find a way. Mm -hmm. Um, And then leaving was just like a really, it was really hard for me because I was in London on my own with no one to, no safety net. You know, I didn't have like a home to go back to or parents to come pick me up or any sort of gap to feel what I was feeling. I yep. and all of these friends that I'd made from moving to London went back in their second year. And I'm just there, like, to be honest, I was just like, oh, no one would even notice if I completely disappeared. There's not one person who would notice. Mm-hmm. It was like one of the like the really darkest points in my life because I do have really good community now and yep. I have a better relationship with my sister and so on. But at the time that wasn't how it was. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was like, got a job in a wine shop in the day, got a job in, um, a, uh, restaurant in the evening and was just like working to stay in London. So I think so really this, this, like, it's a quite a long thing to give context about what I'm doing. Um, but I guess we can dig into those more, but just to say, you know, then I, I think I was, I was just working to survive for a long time. Yep. I'm not doing creative things. Yep. And it's only in the last, I'd say about, yeah, five <laughs> years, I started throwing myself back into things and trying to figure out where my creativity lies if it doesn't in the format of how it was before yep. the medium of theatre. So, um, yeah, I've been exploring that and uh, these different avenues I found really satisfying because it's still storytelling it's just yeah. like in a different way yeah 100 percent, and that's exactly why i started podcast thing was it was just l- learning from other people like the main reason we started this whole project was it gave me an opportunity to learn what i needed to learn but then also teach others so like it was a really weird because people look at particularly they're not quite pod people are like what is the podcast and i'm like well it's kind of i suppose me in a nutshell of it's business meet business entrepreneurship meets disability inclusion activism and sort of creative so it's all sort of meld into one so it's then trying to summarize that into what it is because everyone kind of goes is it a business podcast is it this is it that when actually you just articulated it perfectly it was another creative way of me exploring where i wanted to go rather than perfectly fitting in a little box Totally. And we're human. We're not supposed to fit in these boxes. Like we're so complex and ever changing. And I think it's a massive shame that society has made us feel like when someone says, what do you do? You've had, you've got to have a really clear answer for that. Because for me, the joy comes from the curiosity and speaking to people and similar to what you said, and then sharing knowledge and lifting each other up and having interesting conversations and that doesn't have to happen just through a piece of theater or just for a yeah. podcast that yeah. can happen through lots of mediums which i've been exploring yeah you've done quite a list so you run uh you run a podcast yourself with your sister if if my research serves me every time i quote my research there's that little bit You're of like, it that's like is this gonna go horribly wrong um yeah so you run a, a podcast with your sister you've done lots of presenting gigs you've done work in broadcasting, you've been all over the place. So how did you end up from working in a wine bar, just working to live to then essentially having so many different creative avenues that even I'm looking at it going, I don't even know how you keep up. Well, you know what? It's that thing where it's like, I don't want to be put in a box, but I've realized that you can do lots of things in life, but you can't do them all at once. It's not sustainable. You could do a few at the same time, but you can't do everything. And that's been a hard lesson to learn. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm trying to think. So 
Well, yeah, I, I, um, I was doing all of these sort of hospitality jobs just to survive. Yeah. And then I was making myself really ill. Um, because with my disability, it's a progressive muscle wasting disease and it affects my legs, my shoulders, um, my hips. So I can't uh, stand for long lengths of time. I experience a lot of pain and fatigue. I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user yeah. and I've only been using a wheelchair in the last three years and it's changed my life for the better. Um, which we can chat about a bit more, but yeah, like using mobility aids has been really incredible and supportive for me. But when I was, you know, when I'd had to leave my um, degree and just work, I didn't have like disabled people in my life. Yeah. I didn't yeah. have the community. I also, even though um, we've still got a long way to go, of course, mm -hmm. um, it is very different now. And I think a lot of grief I have so much joy when I see, uh, you know, people graduating from a drama school or a, a, a dance degree who are in a wheelchair or are, yeah, are disabled. That because I'm like, this is, I'm so glad, and of course that should exist. But it wasn't how it was for me. It was no. like, oh, you can't do these things. You're disabled, so bye. Like you don't yeah. fit into yeah. this industry. So a lot of grief comes from that because I think to myself. You know, it could have been a bit different if maybe uh, things have already changed then. 100%. I mean, that's pretty much telling my story. I left uh, left school with two A-levels in performing arts. Everyone looked at me and said, uh, I, I also A-starred in both, and everyone looked at me and said, well, you could pretty much walk into any performing arts school or uni that you wanted to. But then the reason I never pursued the career was because I didn't want to be cast into type. But the only way I was ever going to get a job was being the guy in the wheelchair and i'm sorry but it gets to a point where i want to be challenged as an actor i don't want to be fitting in this little oh charlie always plays the guy in the wheelchair and i think that's the real challenge when it comes to anyone being particularly in the forming industry it's changing now but particularly when i left the opportunities weren't there there was no way i could turn it into a profitable career where i could have lived comfortably and then you add in the instability of that industry add a disability on top and it was like oh my god what what what, what am i going to do so that's when i ended up essentially just going into digital marketing because i was like uh what else do i do panic to win <laughs> okay i'll go do that yeah totally and i think that's the thing we do just have to adapt and find other ways to create and other ways to make money because we live under capitalism um but yeah, I know I totally hear you. It's just, it wasn't there. And so when I, I had like a really, um, yeah, a bit of a dark time and I was doing, because I was struggling with the hospitality work, I was then doing work that was like a bit unhealthy and a bit dangerous. And I was definitely, I mean, this was so long ago now, I was, would have been about, yeah, 20, 21. And I was like, self-medicating with recreational drugs and just was really lost and understandably you know I there was a part of me that kind of used to feel shame about that and then as I've you know been in therapy and worked through things I'm like I was really doing my best and uh yeah. it was it was a challenging time and then I you know being becoming disabled impacted every aspect of my life and I'm very proud to be disabled uh but at the time, because I didn't have these networks and I yeah. didn't understand the social model, you know, I didn't have all of this um, stuff to advocate for myself and um, facilitate my journey. It was very like I did experience a lot of shame and I felt like a failure. And so I ended up um, yeah, really ill. And then I didn't have anywhere to live because I couldn't keep up with all of this work because I hadn't found the things that I'm doing now. And so I ended up living in a homeless hostel for two years with no Wi-Fi. So that was really challenging. Um, and that was when I was like, you know what, as much as it's really difficult to be here, I have an opportunity where I'm not having to think about where my rent is coming, how I'm going to pay for my rent. 
So what I can do is start re-exploring my creativity. So I um, looked at different courses for unemployed people. And I'd always been interested in presenting because same thing with you. Like I love talking to people. I'm very mm -hmm. curious. Um, and so then I was like, oh, maybe um, I'll look at doing a radio presenting course. And I went to Manchester for, I think it was a week. And this amazing grassroots uh, radio station called Reform Radio, they bring in a lot of young talent um, to help yeah, give them a space to explore things. Yep. And so I did that course and that felt really great. And then I was like, okay, I think I could do this. Like I'm quite good at this. And then I went into the roundhouse and yep. did some courses there. So then over these, you know, this like year, I was just throwing myself into anything where I could learn, which was like, yep. you know, sessions were like two quid, or if you're unemployed, sometimes it would be like a free course. Yeah. So I was doing all sorts like radio um, courses, like drop-ins. And then I was doing a bit of poetry. The poetry stuff, I realized I'm not actually a very good poet, but it was still good to explore. <laughs> I'm <laughs> Can't be good at everything. <laughs> <laughs> but look, I love poetry. I love yeah. reading it. Um, my very emotional Pisces heart is very drawn to poetry, but I was like, it's not exactly my calling, but still yeah. it helped me find my voice again you know so I um yeah I pitched a radio show idea to Transmission Roundhouse which is the mm. radio station at the Roundhouse and uh it was called The Wobbly Road yeah. and it was an interview show where I would explore the more like difficult hardships and vulnerabilities and how important they are to our life so I would interview like creatives entrepreneurs um yeah, different people and chat about their experiences. And then from there, I just started to get a bit more like freelancing uh, mm. radio work. And uh, it is just one of those things that like, when you start out, you're like, how am I going to end up doing this as a career? But once it gets rolling and you're in these yep. networks and a lot of the jobs that I got was like people, just from being myself, like I wasn't even intentionally you know, having a conversation with someone with the thought that this will then get me a job. Yeah. But I would just be being myself and I'd be in a studio and chatting to someone. And then, you know, a good friend of mine, Ray, um, we're really good friends now, but at the time, you know, he was also had a show on transmission and we're chatting and I was just telling him, you know, about like how I'm re-exploring my creativity and a bit about me being a dancer. And then he pitches me, you know, a few months later, this radio idea for uh, BBC Radio 4, about me going on a journey of um, chatting to different people about where their creativity lies once they can't do their chosen medium. And so this was the, this was like my first, yeah. uh, except from my, my podcast that I was doing, this was my first like, uh, yeah, I guess professional. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah radio presenting yep. job. Um, and yeah, since then I've just been working, making audio documentaries. Um, audio series, uh, podcasts, working on other people's stuff as well as my own. And uh, yeah, it's been amazing because, I mean, it, it can be challenging. The audio industry is also the same as lots of industries with its own faults um, yep. and its own barriers. And I still struggle to get work sometimes, but I've had like amazing opportunities um, and it's definitely it's definitely given me another way to, yeah, bring stories to life and like build these worlds. Um, so yeah, I really love, really love what I do. Love that. I want to just come back to a point that you made earlier of like your journey in terms of re-exploring your creativity, but also not having money to sort of finance that and sort of the different things that you explored that were low cost. Because I think particularly for a young person coming out of school, any of that, there's all these things they want to do, but they're like, oh, I've got to go apply for this course or I've got to go do this open uni degree or whatever it might be. So in your experience, obviously yours was kind of, you were forced into it. So that, that obviously creates an extra layer of, you didn't have a choice, so you, you just did it. But if you were taking a step back and looking for other young people, how, where would you say look for these free courses or local courses in, in the industry you're in to sort of give them a leg up? 
Yes. So um, I think one of the best things to do is just to throw yourself into stuff. And I know it can be really scary, um, but doing uh, for, for audio stuff, I would recommend looking at these programs that are in place for, especially if you're like 18 to 25, there's also some that go up to 27 or 30 now, which as it should, because we can be an emerging artist at any age and lots of people need support. And I think it's very ageist that we expect people to have found what they want to do and that there's, you know, there should always be space to be starting and having a career change. Um, But, you know, there are, there are a lot of good things in place. I would really recommend the roundhouse um, because they do so many different courses. There's transmission roundhouse, which is the station there. But also they do like two, you pay two quid for like a two hour radio drop in. You can do DJ lessons there. Um, There's also all sorts of um, like production courses. And so I would just go online and literally look at, you know, the Roundhouse, City Lit. There's an amazing program called uh, Multitrack, which also Mm. helps aspiring producers um, get opportunities and they link them up with different production companies to get work experience. Wow, that's cool. They're really, really great. And uh, I think the main thing that I did, which I found really helpful, was like sign up to loads of newsletters. So type in, you know, radio opportunities or um, creative access. And there would be and for me, it wasn't even just with audio stuff. Like I looked at part of part of the main, which do really low cost theatre stuff. Yeah. There's also masterclass, which have lots of uh, free tickets for things. So sign up to as many newsletters as possible, because then you're not missing things because it is coming um, through your inbox, and then you can apply for stuff. And um, yeah, I think don't be afraid to throw yourself in at the deep end yep it's so scary and like i remember going into my first sessions and i was like oh everyone's so cool everyone knows more than me you know well there's that awkward thing of like a couple of them know each other and you're the only one that doesn't know anyone and you kind of just sat there like right okay and i suppose that's one thing we're both quite lucky with of i'd imagine you're the same as me of right i've just got to get talking to someone once i get talking to someone then They'll talk to me. (laughs) Totally. And look, we're also not going to like everyone. You know, there's lots of people in a space where you're like, oh, I'm not vibing with you. That's totally fine. But there are those gems and that you connect with. And uh, you I know it's so annoying to talk about like networks, but it really is everything. And even with my most recent job, um, well, my most recent big job, uh, I had this series that I worked on called Witch for BBC Sounds and Radio 4. And it's done amazing. And we're all really proud of it. And that was because I was invited uh, to speak on a panel at the Roundhouse. And I was chatting about Honey in the Hex, which is my podcast with my sister, mm-hmm. which explores uh, folklore. I really love the entanglement of myth and reality and how we bring magic into our life. and even if you don't realize you're being your, if you don't believe in magic, but you, there's still things that you do that are kind of magical. And it's really interesting. So I was chatting about that and I was talking about my kind of, cause it's got witchy elements to it. My podcast with my sister and India, who's this uh, amazing journalist, presenter and producer was also on the panel and came up to me after and said, Oh, I think you'd be a really good fit. Um, we don't really know much yet, but, can I get your contact? You might be a good fit for this job. And then, yeah, you know, things sometimes don't show up till quite a while after. And that's the thing that I always tell people, just like trust what you're doing. Things don't happen straight away. You could have had a conversation with someone that actually then gets you a job in two years. Like as long as you're being yourself. um, Yeah. 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 And then, and that was it. And then, you know, I had a, Zoom call with uh, India and the exec and ends up working on the job. And it's been one of the most rewarding jobs ever for me. And has really uh, given me so many more skills in like my radio producing, uh, like documentary making. So, um, yeah, I think when, 
when you're starting out, you don't want to get burnt out. Like don't push yourself too much, especially if you've got a disability, it's extra layer that you can't be at everything. But I think if you be intentional about what you go to. So when you do go, make sure you're there, taking it in, having intentional conversations. And um, yeah, probably not every conversation will lead to something, but there will be some that do. Definitely. And I also want to come back to a point that you mentioned earlier as well, because you said it and I was like, we've got to dive into this. Where does the love of folklore I don't even know what you'd call it. Uh, witchcraft, I guess. Is this, yeah. I don't know what the right phrase is. Um, where did that love come from? Like, where did it stem from? So me and my uh, sister growing up, Tansy, we were always like into sort of magical witchy things. Like we would celebrate Halloween uh, passionately. You know, that was our biggest celebration in the year. Our mum was kind of, quite like that like she would use like a pendulum to find her shoes that she'd lost so we were sort of growing up around yep. that Fair kind enough. of like mystical way of living um, yep. it's funny because I'm a very actually a very logical person and I am quite skeptical about things um and I don't think oh if you just use magic uh everything's just going to happen for you it's about bringing the combination of magic and action together yeah um but yeah so we we my sister and i we had a very challenging relationship for most of our lives um and it was only been in the last four years that we have a better relationship and it's been really nice to have this project honey and the hex together because we both loved folklore which is folk is people and law is stories and is the passing down of stories through generations um and like lots of legends and myths and magical things but what we were finding is like when we were looking for you know a podcast to listen to it would be so academic in its language yeah. it was very like uh white straight man um there was just not there was just like not a lot of diversity in the stories that were being told or the way that they were being told. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, me and my sister, we're not historians. We're not claiming to be, um, you know, really knowledgeable or academic on this, but what has worked is people have messaged us such nice messages all the time saying, you know, like this has filled a gap that I was looking for because, yep. uh, you do it through a progressive, uh, intersectional lens and people have felt like they were missing that so yeah we delve into lots of different folklore stories we've done some events as well which has been really nice want to do a bit more of that and that's great because people will send us dms saying like oh i feel like i'm in the space with you and talking to friends and then we were like that's so nice but we want to be able to also feel that you know and have that connection yeah. offline so we've been doing a bit more of that um but yeah, it's interesting, these things, like, especially with, you know, folklore and all of these tales are about working class people. Yeah. But then we're the ones we're sort of kept out of uh, when it's yeah. shared in the media. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that that is true. And uh, like you say, I think it's one of them areas where the language has caught up it's like i've always said like to to bring it back to a point of reference to me i've always said when i was studying things like shakespeare stuff i always took it in more when it was in a language that i could understand i mean there's an element of that that plays into my dyslexia but but, but there's also an element of it was just relatable and it's right of like educational material or any material that where you're learning about a certain subject whether it's uh whether it's I can't forget the word, like whether it's educational or not, should be in a way that you can understand and that should be readily available, whatever category or area you're wanting to look into, because then it develops an understanding of it. Because if everyone gets caught up in jargon, and this is something we experience in the disabled community, if everyone gets caught up in jargon, no one knows what the fuck to say next. They're like, can I say this? Can I not say that? I, did I say the right thing? I don't know. And it, it, that's where it all stems from. It's just that whole thing of, Put it in a context that people will understand. Totally. And it's so frustrating when you go to a panel or something, which is literally about accessibility. 
and people are talking in academic jargon. You're like, how do you expect us all to be yep. learning in this space if we can't understand? And you're actually using really inaccessible language. Yeah, it definitely. happens a lot. Definitely, and I think as well that there's another element of that of using gender fluid language because that's also an area that people are still getting used to. They're still developing it, and like so, even for me, like my brain still doesn't i always have to correct myself when i'm speaking to someone but then it's just because i haven't it's not become habit yet but then i think there's also i mean i don't know if speaking from my experience there's also that fear that comes with what i also see in the disability side of things of people not wanting to offend someone so then they kind of just steer away from the subject if that makes sense and there has to be space. We have to give people space to make mistakes. There's a big difference of somebody choosing to be harmful. And once you've told them something that they repeatedly don't learn and they don't want to, to someone slipping up. Um, and for me, you know, there's always things that I'm learning. And uh, I feel fortunate that I have people around me who will just sort of like call me in and be like, oh, that term isn't great because of this. And I'm like, thank you so much for like giving me the space to be able to acknowledge that and change the way that I say things. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's just a lot of infighting and that can be really unhelpful because if you look back at historical moments where things have really shifted, it's when people are working together, not spending so much time fighting each other course there's a time and a place to be pissed off with someone but there's a big difference of um constantly um at people without giving them the space to grow and learn yeah yeah and it's that whole thing you don't want an individual feeling that like they constantly have to second guess everything that they're, they're saying i would much rather um, um whenever i deal with the whole thing of like oh what happened to you i would much rather people ask the burning questions they want to ask and then i deal with the terminology after the fact of going wouldn't necessarily use this word and this is why rather than them have it, me having to go stop them every second word and be like okay hang on before you finish your point because then people just get lost and i think that's the big mm -hmm. thing is people get lost with all the changes in terminology in the disability space people just get lost because they don't know what to say next it's like the whole i mean i always get very passionate about this whole thing of x Calling a disabled toilet, you can't call it a disabled toilet. But then I'm like, to be honest, I, I agree with the the sentiment that there is a more inclusive language that we could use so that it means that everyone's included. However, realistically, I don't give a shit what it's called. I give a shit that I can get in it and go to the toilet. I, I don't call it the ginger's toilet. I don't care. I really don't care. But yeah, I think that's the whole thing of I always I'm always banging on about like, can we focus on fixing the practical issues sometimes? I think that's, I suppose I, I view that from maybe a, a biased lens with a physical disability, but then I do often look at it and go, should we not be focusing on the fact that you can't get into work and you don't want to, you can't get into the industry that you want to be in, you can't access restaurants you want to go to, can't go on trips you want to go on, whether that be because of a yeah. neurodiversity or whether that be because of a physical disability. It's like, yeah, I, I, I mean, I've got on a massive tangent here, so I apologise, but yeah. No, it's... no, I completely hear you and I agree. And I think um, that's what I also mean about where are we putting our energy? And uh, if we're spending it so much on actually, yeah, things that do matter, but do they matter as much as other things? And is it that deep? For me, I don't really think so. Um, so I think, yeah, there's a lot of ways we can be spending our energy um, without getting so in like stuck intertwined. In, like, yeah. Yeah. hundred um, percent. Another thing I wanted to touch on with you, you briefly mentioned it earlier that you've gone through therapy and obviously more and more people are exploring therapy. It's something that I'm looking into at the moment. Not necessarily, I suppose mine's, this is the often debate I have with my friends because my friends have gone through it for their own reasons and also more of the traditional reasons, but I'm curious to do it to see what a therapist pulls out of me rather than needing to go through a traumatic experience and, and untangle that. But what's your experience of therapy been? What advice would you give to anyone that's possibly looking into it? Yeah, just take us through your, your journey. 
So I started having therapy when I was 19, a group therapy, um, mostly because of uh, obviously my disability was a massive element of why I need therapy and actually is more so now. But the reason why I started it was because of a lot of really dark things in my childhood that created a lot of trauma. And so I, yeah, started doing group therapy. It didn't really work for me. Uh, but it's hard because if you don't have the finances to go private, you are having to access the NHS. Yeah. So then that didn't really work. And then I went to I went to my GP and got um, sessions. I think it was like maybe six months of therapy, um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. And yep. that was just not even that was just cutting the surface, but not getting deep enough. And so yeah. I was looking at other things. I was wait on waiting lists for ages. And finally, I'm doing um, psychotherapy, which is much better for me. Um, and that's for a charity. So it's low cost. And so I only pay uh, £10 a session, oh, wow. which is amazing. Yeah. But the problem with this is, you know, this is the route. I mean, I have been sort of in therapy for 10 years. So it's been uh, a lot of trial and error. So I, it's hard to kind of give advice about therapy because um, everyone has a different sort of uh, circumstances. But what I would say is um, for me, my first therapist, well, my first two therapists, it didn't work. And I'm, but I'm glad that I didn't give up and it takes yeah. time. And that's so frustrating because you're like, oh, I'm having to open up and, uh, and share all these things. And then yeah. what if it doesn't work out? How can I do it all again? But I think uh, therapy has been amazing for me. And I think that I do think it's for everyone and people would disagree with that. And they'd say, no, but it's not for me. But I, I think it's actually just about finding a therapist that is right for you, which can take some time. 100%. I personally don't really agree with things like, I don't know if I should say the actual name of it or not, but some online therapies through these better help. help. Better help has yeah. been really bad for a lot of my friends and like quite problematic. So I personally yeah. wouldn't go that route, which is annoying because it's, it was an accessible way to get therapy. So it sucks. Um, but I would say if you have enough money, um, look for a private therapist. If you're queer, there's lots of uh, queer, low cost therapies out there. I wish I could remember the name of it, but if you do some Googling um, and maybe go on to, um, an Instagram page which is supportive of queers, um, like an organization or a charity, and you can even ask mm -hmm. them, where could you signpost yeah. me? Um, but yeah, I it's been really great for me. Um, I think being disabled, it's like I'm so proud of who I am and I have worked so through so much shame about being um disabled, you know, because we live in a world that's very ableist. So yep, we internalize yep. some of that. And so it's helped me process some things, but you know, some stuff, it's just hard to even shift, but it definitely helps to be able to talk about it. 100%. And I think as well, it's it, your, your testament to it of having gone through what you went through in younger to where you are now, the, the difference was from what I'm hearing is, is huge. And I think that shows the power of like, just, working through stuff like you never stopped from what i've heard you never stopped going you just kept kept showing up and not to turn this into an inspirational porn mm -hmm. episode like it's not that but it's just to show like you were also from your story it's very much like you did a lot of the growing yourself and that's a really tricky thing to do particularly like as they said accepting therapy that's something that not many people are able to do normally it's as i say there's still the taboos around it where so i'm a big believer of like there's places for therapy everywhere you see it used in uh you see it used just to help people you see it used in business you see it used in sport like there's a place for everywhere like you say as well it will just help you in the long run but it's yeah it's, it's really nice to hear one thing i did want to touch on as well is your journey with your gender fluidity and how that maybe changed how you grew up and how early that came into the equation yeah if you don't mind i mean i'm asking very some of these questions you're probably thinking bloody hell is this guy is this guy for real but yeah it's just no i I'm love curious. it get into the deep end i'm i'm down <laughs> for it um 
Yeah, I mean, I'd always known that I was queer in my sexuality. I'd never really struggled with that. I mm. so I'm pansexual, so I'm attracted to people regardless of gender. The gender yeah. doesn't really matter to me. It's um yeah, it's just if I connect with someone. And so from a very young age, I was exploring um my sexuality with girls before I was even going anywhere near boys. Mm-hmm. Um and yeah, I was kind of uh, always fine with that. I guess one of the good things about neglect as, is that you don't really have someone paying attention and telling you you're doing something wrong. Mm. <laughs> Silver <Fair> linings. <laughs> 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 no, but you know, because it's kind of like, I've always been so self-assured and yeah. always changing, you know, and always learning. Like, I'll definitely look back and be like, oh, God, that was cringe what I did. Or, oh, I yeah. was ignorant and so on. But there's been a baseline sense of self that I've always had and very much been like life come at me you know and 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 not in a toxic positivity way because I absolutely think it's important to um rest and to say when things are terrible and all of that but there has been this drive in me where I'm like if I want something no one's going to give it to me I have to get it myself yeah and um that's also going on a slight tangent here, but I'll come back to the point. But that's also been really hard for me to become disabled because I was so hyper-independent. I could have, which is totally unhealthy, gone through life never asking anyone for anything and felt safe like that because I'm like, anything I have, I'll get it myself. I can't rely on other people. You know, all of that. And then now it's like, nope. You know, we, even if you're not disabled, we thrive in community and being alone in solitude is an important aspect of our lives but we also need community around us so becoming disabled was like the universe was giving me this massive challenge of uh not only being disabled in the world that we're living in but also that i couldn't be hyper independent anymore and i had to rely on um accepting help and all the people in my life would be like you still struggle with that, <laughs> which mm. is true. Progress. But I'm getting better. Progress, progress. Yep. I'm definitely getting better. Um, so yes, this is, uh, so with my sexuality, I was sure and open about that. I was always, when I was a kid, I felt quite strange and that I didn't really identify with girly things, but obviously mm. th- this is all made up stuff anyway. Yep. You know, gender yep. is just play and made up but if we're looking at the binaries within our society i wasn't a very um stereotypical way that we would see a girl yeah Yeah. but i didn't really know until um so yeah I, i kept with my sexuality i even though i was queer and i was always attracted to lots of different genders i did because of how life is end up being in relationships with men more than other genders, um, which has taken a whole U-turn because I'm now hardly ever (laughs) with men. Fair enough. I respect that. Yeah. Never say never, but it's uh, not something that's in my life at the moment. And I've been absolutely happy with that choice um, and not missing (laughs) it. (laughs) But, you know, we'll see how it goes. But, um, yeah, with my gender, it was actually... Uh, I think it was in about maybe 2020 when uh, Instagram, I don't know if you can remember this, but Instagram had given the opportunity to put your pronouns in your bio. Yeah. Yeah. And I went to put she, her, and I went, this, no. this does not feel right. And I'm in a group chat with my two sisters, Tiger and Tansy. Tiger's great names. What, three great, T's. what great names. Tansy Tatum and Tiger, the best thing my mum ever did for us. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we, we were like, I put it in the group chat to them because we're all very open and that's really lovely that we have that relationship. And I said, I'm not feeling like she, her. And they said, well, we definitely do. So if you're not, that's something to explore. And I was like, yeah. And I, it's funny because I had I had already friends who were using they, who, they them pronouns. They, them. and. Yep. And, and also um, trans friends. And I was very much in these worlds. And even though I'd been feeling all of this stuff within me for so long that I 
you know, wasn't necessarily, didn't really identify with a lot of things that other people, other women did. Mm. I didn't really see it for myself. And then I explored like, oh, okay, I'll put she, they in my uh, bio. And then I played around with like, they, them, and then like took it out again. So I was just giving myself the space to explore. And then I was like, oh, I think I'm keeping on to the she because it's easier because people, even people in my life, even though I've told them that I'm gender fluid, um, still slip up with it. And I was almost doing it as a safety of not wanting to make them feel uncomfortable. And then I thought, you know what, this is my life. I've got to be really truthful yeah. to who I am. And I, whenever somebody would use the wrong pronouns, it didn't feel right. Um, and it's okay, you know, even when I was with my friend having dinner the other night and she was like, oh, I'm with my girly. And I gently held her hand and said, this isn't an attack. I just want to remind you that I don't identify with that. And of course she was like, thank you so yeah. much. Like, yeah, it was just a yeah, slip yeah. up. As I said it, I realized, and that's the thing, like it takes time and it's okay. You know, yeah. it's, um, so yeah, like now I'm living in my full queer, Love it. gender fluid identity. And, uh, I just feel like the best I've ever felt, the more me I've ever mm. felt. And, um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like I went on that journey with my best friend, and my je- best friend and um, identifies as they them, and um, we'd been friends since school. Like I'm talking like year nine to now, and uh, like it was him. I did it there. Them transitioning to the different pronouns was really tricky for me, just because of like silly little things. Like we always still always used to go to each other like bro, dude, and I was like, actually, can I still? Can I still do that? Or do I need to change? So he was like, no, these ones are fine. This one isn't. But then it just shows as well that it's that whole thing of like, we don't always have to perfectly fit in a box. Like some people are okay with certain terms to still be used. Certain people aren't. It's it's really interesting. I mean, I, I, I have to openly admit, I still find, as you heard then, I still find the remembering really hard. I don't know whether that's in in conjunction with some other stuff being dyslexic and just generally taking longer to to learn something or whether it is just because i'm not where obviously we're now outside of school not with them all the time so then i'm not having the constant reinforcement of it but yeah, yeah it's, it's an interesting elements. journey mm, definitely and i think it's what is once again is like language is so flawed and that's why i give lots of space for mistakes because it's like if someone calls me bro i'm like yeah or if someone calls me king or something that is actually seen as a masculine term i love it but then of course if i'm going to say that around uh one of my friends who is a trans woman that could be really dysphoric for yeah, her yeah. you know so we just got to do our best to reflect the language that people use for themselves and i think 100% that's the best way to go um yeah and uh and yeah, give each other space. Um, and also I think push ourselves and realize we can do this. Like we, we, we can, we can get it right and keep working on it. So it's that thing, isn't it? This combination of being kind to each other and to ourselves and also always striving to be able to make people feel that they can be completely themselves around us and within society. 100% Hundred percent, and I think as well, it's that whole thing. Of, I really, one thing I'm really passionate about with this whole segment is this whole thing of like people getting really funny about it when it's nothing to do with them. It's like if someone wants to use a different pronoun, it makes no difference to you. Just try your best to remember the right pronouns. Like it's not going to kill you if you'd prefer to be he, she, or whatever it might be. Leave them to it. Like if you want to go by the traditional pronouns, that's fine. That's your choice. It's like I like. Mushrooms, you don't like mushrooms. It's the same fucking thing. I don't, I really don't get the argument. I'm like, just if someone asks you to use a different pronoun, use a different pronoun. It's not rocket science. It's like if I know, someone changed name. Yeah. I don't know why people are so stuck. Um, well, it's just easier for them, isn't it? And it's yeah. like, get a grip. It's not that hard. I mean, my brain's still, I mean, I do struggle with the, the uh, abbreviation of LGBTQ+, because there were so many layers to it, and it's such a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, obviously as well, like, I'm saying all of this, but, you know, my processing can be really yep. slow, and I'm also dyslexic. So, look, 
it's it's you know we can't always get yeah. it right but i think there is a difference of um when people are intentionally trying to hold on to the way that they think and like that's a massive shame because actually yeah. like there's so much beauty in being able to open up your mind to lots of different identities and lives and it's only going to be a good thing for your life so i think it's really sad for people who won't shift their perspective because that's so limiting because life is so wide and adventurous and so much to learn that like what a shame that you're choosing to be stuck in your ways yeah and i think it's even more like though the other thing i think of is like being like self enjoying talking to different people and exploring different things then you're limiting yourself to the people that we you can explore because you're then automatically shutting off that part of the community because they don't feel comfortable because any time they mention anything to do with a certain topic they're passionate about, you'll start interrogating them about it. And I'm like, interrogate them with an element of curiosity. Yeah, by all means, to help you understand something, but don't attack someone. I, I really don't get that. Yeah, for sure. And I think this is where it comes back to what we were saying about where are we putting our energy? Because if we're spending time attacking people, uh, about things that actually we could be more like compassionate and open about. There's people like there's big organizations who are massively messing up, especially when it comes to representation and inclusion of disabled people and the sustainability. And it's actually just wild to me. I mean, it was only um, an example of this where people just didn't want to listen. It was back in 2018. I had obviously hadn't done a lot of performing for a while. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I really want to return to that. I was really missing it. But, you know, now I'm in a disabled body. What's that going to mean for me? How do I get back into the industry? And so there's, there was a really well-known um, immersive cinema experience. I don't know if you've seen those. They sort of, uh, they play, a, you go into the world and it's like set up for the movie that you watch. And there's lots of mm. um, actors no, and the whole that. experience is, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Oh, actually, so, yeah, is it, the, a is it the, Mama, actually, is it like the Mamma Mia thing where you, it's like, yeah, everyone's around you. Is it similar to that? S similar, similar to that. Yeah. Um, but I think I actually haven't been to the Mamma Mia one, so I'm not completely sure, but I think maybe that's more of like an, a di a, like an evening with performers well i guess that's yeah 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 it's kind of like you go into this world i've been to one that was um you know stranger things or yeah. um yeah that oh, i can't remember the other one i went to now anyway um so my friend was part of one of the actors in this immersive cinema experience and she was like, oh, so supportive. I was like, oh, Tatum, you should, um, they do open casting for the new, um, the new event that they're putting on, the new show. And I was like, this could be great for me because I don't need an agent and I know that I can do it. Like I'm a very talented actor and performer mm -hmm. and singer. And maybe, yes, I can't dance the way I move my body the way that I could before, but they don't do a lot of that in these shows. And so um, I emailed the email with my CV and with my headshots. And the guy was like, yeah, we would love to see you come in and we do a workshop day. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, OK, I'm obviously going to let him know my access needs because I don't want to turn up to a day. And then they're like, oh, run around the room. And I'm like, now I have that. to tell you, yeah. Of, yeah, a load of people. And so I was like. You know, I, I checked back in with my friend and I was like, oh, what do you reckon I should do? And bless her, you know, she was really like supporting me to advocate for myself. She was like, yeah, you know, just let them know. And so I emailed back explaining, oh, I can't um, run or go up and down stairs, but I can still use my body in lots of mm -hmm, other ways yeah. of movement. And um, it doesn't affect my skill sets for, you know, these like the performing um, and my acting skills and so on. And he just came back to me and said, oh, okay, well, this isn't going to work out because there's lots of different levels in the venue and there'll be lots of moving from place to place. Um, and I always just thought to myself, there wasn't even opportunity. There was no 
conversation to be like, how can we explore this with you? You're a disabled yeah. performer. Of course, there's something that could have been done. I've been mm -hmm. to these events. You can be in one section, which I could have stayed in. I don't have to be moving around the whole place. There's hosting yeah. where you let people in. But it's like, oh, no, that's too difficult for us yeah. to deal with. So yeah. we're just going to say no to you. And what is just so messed up is these shows are supposed to be fresh and innovative. Well, how innovative are you if you can create a whole world, but you can't think about putting a ramp in? Yep. You can't think about having yep. a disabled actor in your show. Are you yeah. okay? Like, yeah, yeah. you're obviously not that talented and creative if you can't think about those things. But that, I'm not going to lie, when I was putting myself back out there again, knocked it back. knocked me. Yeah. It knocked me right back. And I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And I experienced kind of, I felt embarrassed. Of course, mm. I shouldn't have felt embarrassed. And now, years later, I'm like, oh, that's literally discrimination. Yeah. And because I've been in lots of different circles and I've done the research, I have you know, the tools now to equip yeah. me to yeah, yeah. put people in their place and tell them as it is. Uh, and I think that's something that I really, why I do a lot of the work I do in the accessibility and inclusion world and being vocal and coming on podcasts like this and so on is, I want people who are, yeah, maybe younger or exploring things for the first time in their career, or they've just become disabled to realize you don't have to take that and yeah. uh, to have some of the knowledge that I wish I had at the time. 100%. And even I've got a story of that as well. Like when, I mean, we're going way back when it's not high level performing by any stretch of the imagination, but I was doing my um, final exam for my performing uh, performing arts GCSE. And uh, I we'd added a whole movement piece in because they were concerned about me scoring points on that section and a whole like seated dance sequence. And I got the final result back. Uh, I got downgraded for a lack of physical movement no yep no got downgraded for a lack Stop. of physical movement yep yep and the bear in mind as well i but it was a very emotive piece and i'd made the examiner cry my drama teacher cry and all of the audience and i was like don't know what more i could have done but there you go <laughs> literally i really worry about what happens in people's brains like that think that's that's yep. an okay thing to say or that that, that will even cross someone's mind but it does it really does yep, it does it does but then it all comes down to exposure this is my big argument with it all is it's all down to exposure if you're not exposed to it you're not going to know about it so then it's it's the how do you gradually increase someone's exposure and that's why we need to do more in the media space of getting it out there but getting it really out there rather than just this tokenism and what we're often seeing now of like oh we need a guy in a wheelchair so we'll go get charlie because he'll play that role quite nicely and he won't complain too much and it's like no i want to be judged on my own performing merit not on we need someone to tick a box it's a it's a it's an interesting Definitely. dynamic <laughs> yeah and it's that isn't it it's like we are just as uh diverse and complex as anyone um just because we have in common that we're disabled um yep. we all have our own stuff obviously but what's so frustrating is people don't think about that because they're not exposed to it so when they do see disability they see one story they see either a victim mm. or they see inspiration and actually there needs to be so much more space which we're exploring where the character is just disabled but it's not about their disability yeah yeah but also not to deny the disability because of course when you're disabled that is going to come into the storyline possibly you know sometimes it's not that it's like oh we just don't acknowledge it but it's yeah. the fact that it's not this tokenism and it's not the reason why that I, that character is cast 100 percent, 100 and we are seeing that gradually prove like i always use the reference point i think of everyone using of sex education there is definitely things they've done really well and that things that can improve but they've made a step in the right direction and that's what we need more of is just uh, but then again it comes back to our point earlier of like allowing 
um, creative outlets and, and people that are in charge of the scenarios to make mistakes. Like I'd much rather someone makes an absolute balls up of it, but I can see what they were trying to do rather than never doing it. Yeah. And I, actually something you said earlier, which I wanted to ask you about is how do you feel about people coming up to you and asking you questions in public? See, uh, this for is, example, yeah. Yeah, this is a weird one for me because uh, uh, unlike some people in the community, and I know it's, it's a very personal thing, so I very much am an advocate of I want to create a referral culture. So if you're not comfortable speaking on it, direct someone in, to a person that is because I do have a big fear of like, I don't want someone to be nervous talking about talking asking about disability. So I always advocate for if you're not comfortable, direct them towards me. So for me, I kind of weirdly thrive on it. Like I quite like it. Because I then feel like I'm educating someone. Like I've done, uh, you've probably seen, I've done content surrounding pretty much every facet of my life and the one that everyone asks me about. Yes, I have done stuff around intimacy and dating and people. That's where everyone's brains go whenever I meet someone in a bar. It's like, so how do you and how do you and Gina, you know, how do, how do you do that? And it's like, here we go again. But I, I weirdly, yeah, I weirdly enjoy it. And I think. I understand, obviously, not everyone has to be like me, but I do wish that we could get to a point where if you're not, you say someone, oh, okay, I've got a friend, because what I really see quite a lot is that whole hesitation of, can I, can I, can I ask you a question? And I'm like, yeah, go on. And they're like, really? And I'm like, yeah, it's absolutely fine. I have no problem with it because unfortunately you're like the sixth person tonight, so you might as well just keep going. <laughs> um, but but I understand it's, it's a very tricky thing because some people aren't at that stage with their disability. So it's it's a tricky thing. But me personally, I kind of weirdly enjoy it because I'm a bit of a weirdo like that, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> yeah, that's it, isn't it? Everyone's so different. I think for me, it's like I want my friends or my partners to ask me questions because um, I want them to know about me and I want yep. them to understand disability more. And Lots of my friends have said, and, and my partners have said, that uh, when I'm out in the world, I see all of these things now that I didn't see before. Hundred percent. So you know, same thing. That, yeah, and and, mm, and it's great because it's like they then start advocating, and yeah. um, it is that yeah. exposure thing, isn't it? Mm. The, uh, the the one I always relate to is like I'll get my friends texting me like I found a new accessible restaurant and I'm like dude all right okay cool but I, I appreciate the excitement but <laughs> yeah yeah oh how sweet so excited about it oh that's cute yeah no it is it is nice and I think um, yeah it, it it's people it, things are changing with that and people are becoming more aware of it oh there's something I was gonna say on. What were we talking about? Oh, about, yeah. I think for me, people in my life ask me questions, great. Mm. And it's nice that, you know, they'll ask beforehand, oh, can I ask you something about your disability? Or can yeah. I ask you something that I might not use the right terminology? And I'd be like, of course, let's go, let's do this. Yeah. Um, but what I do find challenging sometimes is like in my wheelchair, trying to go about my day and then someone's following me down the street. What happened to you? What happened yeah, to you? Yeah. And it's like, I don't have the energy for this or like, I have people, you know, come up to me and say, can I pray for you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm a witch. Then. Get away from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It sucks, doesn't it? It does. I mean, I think as well, there's always an element of you can under understand the the intention behind the question. If you can see it's just purely a curious person wanting to ask a question, 100%, I'm, I'm a big believer of go for it, go, crack on. But this whole area where it's like, oh, can I pray for you? Oh, what did you do in a past life? Or what happened to you? Like, bro, chill. <laughs> like, just calm down. That but is the it, difference because, yeah. Sorry, come on. No, no, I was just going to say, it's 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 a really tricky one to navigate because that is that can feel very insulting. Even myself, I'll come away from conversations like that and it's like, oh my God, I hate the wider community. Like, why are you why is this still exist but then also i just have to come back to the point i made earlier of like i then have to sit back and go look it's just down to exposure if they've not been exposed to it they don't know how to properly ask the question or what they've are what they've tried to do in their heads is a nice thing but actually the way it's come across is not that 
Yeah, and the curiosity is fine because that's how people learn. And sometimes, you know, people will say to me, uh, "Oh, can I? Is there any chance I can ask you a question?" Mm. And if I have capacity, I'll be like, "Yeah, sure." And if I've been asked so many times that day, and I'm trying to do my food shop, and I'm like, I just want to be left 100%. alone, I'll say, "Oh, I'm just trying to do my thing, actually." So, um, yeah. no, this isn't the right time. So. And, and once again, it's like there's it's all down to context. Um, but it is that like thing where it's like sometimes the intrusive questions, uh, it's the entitlement that people have yeah, as well. Yeah. And um, people projecting things onto you, which is just, and you know, it's so like for me, using a wheelchair has been incredible. Like, I love that I can go out in my chair and be able to concentrate on what people are saying have enough energy to get through uh, yeah. to to be there to be present yeah. if i don't have my chair because i can still walk not too well but i can mm. walk um and it means that when i'm doing that i'm having to think about every yeah. single step i take in case i fall over i'm in so much agony my fatigue fatigue is so high so it's like if i'm in my wheelchair it is so great for me as long as i you know obviously there's the element of then things not being accessible which actually yeah. sucks but when it comes to how i feel being in my chair i feel like there's all this space to be myself and then other people you know projecting this oh so sad yeah, like, yeah. don't be putting that bias on me because that's not how i feel i think that that i have a different different perspective on of like yeah that that stuff's just bullshit you're like oh i'm so sorry for you or like wow you're an inspiration for going out for a pint of milk i'm like fuck off but the more like direct questions where it's more comes from a curiosity point, dude, that stuff I'm fine with. I'm not okay with the whole, yeah, wow, you're out with friends having a drink. I'm like, yes, uh, what else am I meant to be doing, Karen? <laughs> not uh, Karen. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I mean, I've used it to my advantage. I've had it before where people have offered to buy me drinks because they think it's amazing. And I'm like, look, if you're going to offer, I'll take it. But... Yeah, it's it's a weird that that bit of it's weird. The whole you're an inspiration just for doing basic stuff. I'm like, yeah, I think my as hey, I always come back to my favorite of like, wow, you're out with friends having a drink, and I'm like, well, yeah, like what? And I also love this like obviously this has changed the more I've got involved with the civil community, but I also love this whole preconception that every friend that I have has a disability, and I'm like, no. Some of them do, ad admittedly, but some some of them don't. And it's not like we don't have this telepathy thing where we all get together and like, yeah, it's not a, not a thing, mate. I I used to get it all the time with dating. Like, oh, you got a girlfriend? I'm like, yeah, yeah. Is she disabled? I'm like, why is that the first place your brain goes? Like, I always play a little scenario in my head of like two people with the exact same condition. And then it's like, oh, babe, I can't put my shoes on. Well, yeah, neither can I. Well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah yeah it's weird the, it's the weird places people's brains go very but then also then i get entertainment from it that's what, i think why i enjoy the questions thing is because sometimes i look at someone and i just think sure i mean as i've said before like i've said before on the podcast it's one of my favorites today it has to be if me and gina have kids will they come out in wheelchairs it has to be one of my favorites. I'm shook. I have no words <laughs> for that. Wow. I wow. could I was like, you know, when you just stood there going, I don't know how to appropriately respond. <laughs> it's afterwards. I was like, I really should have responded, yeah. Yeah, she's part iron woman. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God, that would be so great. I wish I came out with iron legs that work. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, you like get different upgrades and yeah, oh wow. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so funny. Yeah, I mean, it, it is interesting because it's like for me, I have, yeah, I have a lot of friends who are disabled and I have lots of friends who aren't. And mm. I've also dated people who are also disabled and I've also dated in interabled relationships. And, I, you know, I'm still, I've had lots of experiences where, sadly with partners who haven't been very supportive and it has really um knocked my self-esteem um, um but i've learned from it and i've yeah. i think taking that and realizing not everyone's going to be like that 
And I'd, especially in the last two years where I've been single and I've been in the queer, I was already in the queer scene, but in the queer scene mm. even more uh, because my last partner was a cis man. Um, and coming out of that, I think I was feeling so much like craving being in these queer spaces. Um, and actually queer dating has been really interesting for me because when you're being sexually intimate with someone, mm -hmm. of course, no matter the gender and no matter the sexuality, there should be communication. 100%. And so, but unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of that when I was in relationships that weren't, um, well, they were always queer because I was queer, but, you know, more like heteronormative relationships. And so being in these uh, queer, dating in a queer way and being intimate with people, it's like there's so much communication, which has been really great for me because, um, because it's a natural thing that is more of a given because yeah. you're having to explore more what people like. Um, everyone's got different genitals, which means you have to uh, really communicate what you like and how you feel. And uh, being disabled, I have actually felt so much safer to be disabled in queer spaces because I'm already having to, they're communicating things, I'm communicating things, where when we're having sex, it means I also communicate ele elements of what it is with my disability to them mm -hmm. be intimate. Yeah, yeah. And it gives more space to that because there's already yeah. a conversation. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen with um, straight people, but it's been a really nice experience for me um, going from there not being that as much to me feeling actually a lot safer and safer to be visibly disabled in spaces as well because I get a lot of, uh, when I was in like, a straight pub or a party, I actually would experience a lot more ableism than when I'm in queer spaces where I think because a lot of people already know what it is to experience discrimination and they've been in circles where you've been like, you know, mm. misfits, that people have been more exposed to different different people, that it's been it's been really nice yeah. experience for me to feel safer. Hundred completely understand that. I, I, I've never even thought about it before, but it makes complete sense. Like it's it. They just. I feel like that community just have that ability to just accept more acceptance than let me maybe say your stereotypical community because they've gone through their own struggles themselves. And but then you see that with a lot of people. Like if someone's got some exposure to disability or some exposure to um, a person who's gay they're a lot more understanding of a lot more scenarios rather. It's just, I think automatically, like you say, it's that opening people's mindsets. And if you've already been exposed to one thing, you're a lot more open to being exposed to other stuff. And it's like, right. Okay, cool. Whereas if you haven't, I feel like it's the first domino. The first domino is the hardest one to push over. But then once you get that, then that it's just, just keeps going from there. And it's, it's interesting that as I say, I've never even thought about the fact that that's a more accepting community, but it makes complete sense. Yeah, and it's got its own issues, of course, and especially because a lot of queer spaces aren't accessible um, because they haven't had the funding and a lot of places have closed down. It's still definitely, um, there's a lot of work to do, but I have seen a lot, a, a massive shift with people prioritizing that they will only do an event if the space is accessible. If not, they're not putting on the event, really putting mm. their foot down with that and being like, we're not going to put on this night if it can't be for everyone. And there's been this massive shift uh, for queer nights where disabled people are being listened to and prioritized. And of course, the same as any group or community or space, there is still a lot of discrimination and disabled people, unfortunately, are left as the afterthought, yeah. I would say more than any minority group. And, uh, but overall, being, I'm really grateful that I'm disabled and queer. <laughs> and just, I get that. I do get, and it's interesting, like just as a closing comment on this this point of like, I don't know what order they're going to come out in, but one of our guests coming up recently or has launched already, he's uh, a musician and he has a disability himself, so has now his band will not perform at a non accessible venue. 
and full stop. Great. And I'm like, that's that's what I mean, we need. That is dropping the gauntlet and going, right, fix it. <laughs> yeah. Because people will keep getting away with things if people don't we need people to be really really clear we're mm. not going to do this if not everyone can be here and that's how we make change and yes you might lose money and yes you might disappoint people but we have to we have to be rebellious and we have to be rooting for it um and i think people need to be a bit braver with that 100 percent. i think as i say it's allowing people to make mistakes i'd much rather see an organization try and fail rather than not and now it's funny because you sit there and go most of this relates to businesses and i'm like isn't that the first rule of business the more you fail the more successful you're going to be isn't that like the whole shtick that a motivational speech is all about <laughs> like literally it's, yeah. it is funny just the closing my closing tradition for the podcast um speaking of lots of things that are not quite politically correct what is um one piece of politically correctness that you really strongly agree with or disagree with i really disagree with romantic love being the most important prioritized thing and i think all aspects of love whether it's platonic, monogamous, polyamorous, mm -hmm. all the different shapes of love should be seen as a neutral accepted thing rather than romantic, monogamous love being the, the, basically the given and the expected thing. So I think love coming in all sorts of different forms is really important and uh, should be seen as important as what we're used to or what's kind of thrown onto us. I can be good. And I, I, yeah, I can't kind of play into that, I suppose, because I've always said in the podcast, it's the weird context of someone with a disability in a relationship. There's almost that like, <laughs> sounds terrible, but that I've achieved something mentality of like, it's the goalpost that most of us want to do because it's the full in our heads. It's most of the time that like full acceptance It's the full acceptance of someone fully accepts me for me rather. But then it's true. Like, why is the fixation that? But then I think it's just that whole thing of like feeling quote unquote normal. But I think also that's completely valid. Like if that is something that you want for yourself and you want to have this, uh, you know, a relationship with someone and that's one of the priorities of your life especially for disabled people because we're taught that we're very unlovable then that is completely fair and i think it's uh just the fact that it can look like lots of different things and we don't need to always be rooting for that and like yeah of mm -hmm. course i want to experience love of course i want people to be intimate with people but i think uh recently i've really I've kind of opened my mind to how love can be many things. And actually, uh, my time with my friends and those connections to just make sure that I'm really still seeing that as just as important as romantic love. 100%. And I think that's something like everyone's guilty of, especially me, I suppose, stereotypically being more of a stereotypical male, of that whole thing of like, we find it really weird, like, saying like i love you to friends but then like that should be completely normal because it's just a thing like it, it's a it's a positive it's the why is it a negative it's not no one's gonna be like oh that's that's weird <laughs> like yeah, honestly like, come strange. on we're all gonna die tell each other that we love each other have a good yep. time like you know it's such a shame and obviously it's really difficult for um men because of all of the toxic aspects of masculinity that's thrown onto them and it's like it can be really hard and you know one of the things is we always say oh let men speak you know but they can only speak if we're going to listen so you can mm. tell them to open up and speak and be vulnerable are you going to listen to it are you going to yeah. hold space for it and that's what we do next because you can't just be telling people to speak if you're not going to give space to hear what they have to say and uh i think there has to be a shift with that with all of us because actually in lots of spaces people can still obviously people can be understandably annoyed with men sometimes uh but we really need to hold space for 
um, for love and care and be open to people changing. 100%. And I think that's a perfect point to end the episode on. And thank you so much for coming on, Tatum. It's and thank you so much for being so open as well. It's been amazing. I've learned so much. And hopefully when it goes out, everyone else will learn as much, if not more. Um, yeah, thank you again. But just before you go, I always give my guests a chance to plug themselves. So where can people find you if they want to follow you on your journey? Yeah, let's connect. Um, I am on Instagram at Tatum Carmen. The Carmen is with a K. I'm also on TikTok. I need to post on there more, but that's one of the things I'm going to try and do this year. Um, LinkedIn as well. But yeah, I would say I use my Instagram the most. And I also have an Instagram for my folklore podcast, Honey and the Hex. And if you're into that sort of thing, you can listen to it on all uh, podcasting platforms. And Charlie, thank you so much. Honestly, it's been really fun. And I've also learned lots from you. And um, yeah, it's been really lovely. So thank, thank you. you for having me on. Thank you so much. It's been an amazing episode. Right. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode of the Not Quite Podcast. Please make sure you follow us on TikTok and Instagram to get regular updates about the podcast. These bad dads, they get